Thank Welcome you. to Meryl Thank Street. <laughs> I'm going to start by quoting Mike Nichols, who was our guest on this stage two years ago. And he mentioned in rhapsodically talking about you that you once taught an acting class for him. And he said that what he understood the students telling him afterwards that you conveyed was, you pack your own bag. Those were your words. In other words, that what the actor does is a kind of mystery in terms of preparation. And I begin with that kind of preface because I do want to ask you about <laughs> preparation, which goes against what you were saying in a way. But for a part like this, where I think it was astounding how Mike Nichols was able to call upon the comedic, the dramatic, the musical, the self-deprecating, all these wonderful facets of you. Could you talk a little about how you prepared to be Suzanne? <clears throat> um, I didn't do very much homework for it, I'm afraid. I did take one uh, illegal substance <laughs> <laughs> that I'd never taken before. I thought that was uh, an important part of the research. <laughs> and, but, uh, and I followed uh, Carrie Fisher around for a while. And she uh, and I became, and still are, very good, close friends. And uh, I just immediately knew that I couldn't uh, take, uh, she and I are so different that I had to make a different Suzanne, even though I know so much of this character is based on her. Um, so, I, I don't know, I didn't really do very much, I'm afraid. Well, no, that's okay, I mean, when you read the screenplay, I guess you felt that it was already so filled with the details that you could link into that perhaps you didn't need as much preparation as a script that would have had less to work with? Yeah, I mean, it was so well written. Uh, the book was so well written, and then the screen screenplay came in, and it was um, it was really sharp and amazing and interesting, and uh, filled with so many interesting illusions. And um, I, I just thought I'd be insane not to not to do it. So I also felt like it sounded like me. So I, I, maybe that's a backwards way of explaining or rationalizing why I didn't prepare very much, but it's, it sounded, I, I mean, this is so weird. Uh, I'm echoing. Probably you don't notice it, but I do. I, I feel like we're talking transatlantically, <laughs> um, but that's all right. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it, it didn't seem like a voice that was alien. It felt very much uh, like the more cynical part of me that mm. uh, I carry around. <laughs> the sarcastic wit that you save for certain producers or directors <laughs> or co-stars. You know. And in terms of rehearsal, because so many of the sequences in this film have this great dynamic between you and Shirley MacLaine or you and Gene Hackman or you and Dennis Quaid, etc. Um, rehearsal. I know that when Mike Nichols was here, he talked about the ideal rehearsal period being something like two and a half weeks or some such thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if during rehearsal, that's where you were able to find more of the character. And did you diverge pretty much from the script or, or not at all? <clears throat> um, we didn't. I mean, because she speaks uh, in very distinct rhythms and the characters, uh, you sort of wreck the line if you... Um, diverge too much. Uh, even though some of the scenes sort of cry for improvisation because it, sort of, it was sort of fun to do. Um, but no, I don't, I don't think we, we did diverge too much from it. Um, it's 10 years ago and I barely can remember yesterday, so <laughs> it's really, <laughs> I'm wildly scrolling backwards thinking, <laughs> did we rehearse? Probably, <laughs> if Mike says we did. <laughs> but I know he doesn't remember anything either. So. <laughs> I really should show more recent films in this series. But um, the, the, some of the scenes, especially between you and Shirley MacLaine, they work especially well because the same kind of competitive edge that one knows exists between the mother and daughter 
I know that sometimes exists on a set between two superlative actresses who have roles of almost equal weight. And I was wondering what it was like to work with Shirley MacLaine, who is, in a sense, a mother figure as a formidable star from a previous generation. And what was the dynamic like there, whether during rehearsal or shooting, if you remember it? Oh, <laughs> I remember that very well. <laughs> um, she is just gigantic, you know. She's larger than life and, uh, and many lives. And she's... <laughs> She's, uh, she was fantastic. Um, we had I'd gotten ready, uh, moved it, uh, the family out to California, and we were going to have this first reading, which Mike set up in a way t that I was absolutely doomed to fail in this uh, first reading. And I'd, he did it on purpose, I'm quite sure. It was in a sound stage. A huge room. Um, the tables were set up in such a way that, uh, I mean, it's a huge cast, and the tables were in a big horseshoe. And uh, Shirley was seated at sort of a central, the head of this one table, and everybody else was ranged down in the levels of uh, unimportance. And um, we all came in and she, you know, everybody thought really long and hard about what to wear to the first reading, like all actors do. And <laughs> I, I was, uh, of course, clad in black, coming from New York and <laughs> copying Carrie. I couldn't go wrong, but Shirley came in in 70,000 layers of diaphanous <laughs> pastel. Uh, which she proceeded to start stripping off. It's so hot in here, you know, and she was just, I mean, terrifying, terrifyingly vivid and colorful, and all of us just kind of shrank down into nothingness, and I thought, oh, this is gonna be easy to play, <laughs> this part. Um, and. I was very worried about singing in public because I had been in, music, in a musical on Broadway um, called Happy End, Court Vile, and <clears throat> Bertolt Brecht. And, uh, but that had been years before. And since then, I'd had children. And when you have children, you're not allowed to sing <laughs> in your house. I mean, I don't know and never in the car with the radio. And, you know, so I really hadn't sung in 10 years. <laughs> so I was a little nervous about doing that part of the thing. But I figured, you know, well, I have a nice voice and it'll be all right. And I have weeks and weeks and weeks to, to work on it because we were gonna shoot the big number, the very last day of shooting, the last uh, scene in the film, we shot the last day of shooting. Then we had the rap party. They just let the band keep playing and we started, you know, drinking. <laughs> uh, but we, in the first reading, we read the screenplay. It was very funny, wonderful actors. Everybody was really good. And uh, I got up to sing You Don't Know Me and I did it very sweetly and unrehearsedly, and uh, Shirley got up and sang, I'm Still Here, and she had rehearsed that thing for seven months. <laughs> the moves that you see in the film, she had at the first reading. You know, the, <laughs> I mean, it was unbelievable, and uh, you know, I had to go home and lie down for three days after that reading. <laughs> but it was great. It really set the dynamic, and actually, she was really, she was really wonderful to me. In that first reading, which you described like the horseshoe, were the actors supposed to be reading the script already with the kind of emotion as, as if performing, or did Mike Nichols have you reading it almost? Um, without emotion. I'm just curious about the method that the actor works best with in, in terms of the beginning. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, I mean, we all are led to believe it's a process of discovery, but it's not. <laughs> you know, it's a full-fledged performance. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I ask partly because one of the things that Jean Renoir, who's alluded to briefly in the film when you see the poster for Grand Illusion, his method was to literally have the actors sitting around a table much like the one you described, but to read the script straight through, not just once and not even two times, I think three times, as if it were the telephone book. <laughs> In other words, what he really wanted his actors to do was just familiarize themselves with the words and not act it, but sort of allow the person to interact with the text once it became part of the actors. So I was wondering if that was something that Mike Nichols might have done, but it sounds Never. like... Never. That's no. the weirdest thing I ever heard, because <laughs> um, that's just so attached to text, and maybe it's from another time. Yeah. But that encounter around the table is often the most exciting interaction that you have in a movie because you never ever have it all in one piece again you know you have your little page and a half of the pie every day and you spend laborious hours on it, trying to make it fresh so that first reading is is often thrilling and uh, what you try to get back to mm. um, in the whole long shoot and it's all about making a connection and listening and discovering who this crazy person is. That and Mike Nichols, in terms of how you worked with him, because this was the third of your collaborations after Silkwood and Heartburn, and I have to mention that at the end of Silkwood too, isn't it your voice we hear singing even though it's voiceover the, um, yeah. at the end of, of the film? Uh, it's, yeah. um, I just forgot the, the, which song, yeah, yeah, but it is me. you. <laughs> she had been singing before in a, in a Mike Nichols film, but we didn't get to see you do yeah. it. Um, could you compare what it was like working with him, especially vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, other guests we've had on this stage, like Alan Pakula or Sidney Pollack, or perhaps versus the writer-directors, because you've worked with Woody Allen and Robert Benton and Michael Cimino and Albert Brooks, and I'm guessing that there's a slightly different way that they would approach the direction from somebody like the great craftsman that I mentioned first? Well, I think Mike is so great because it's not the same on each film. It's really he asks what he needs f f within the context of the material. I will say it's the most fun in the world to work with him because he works so hard um, in the process, he, make, uh, entertaining everybody and keeping, keeping everybody happy mm -hmm. and laughing. Even in the most serious things, Mike knows where the joke is, and there's always a joke, even in the most horrible circumstances. Uh, that makes everybody love him. Actors love to work with him because he moves the story and the day through mm. in a way that's productive and creative. And I mean, I wish I could give specifics, but I, it's, it's not sort of what I do. That's right. <laughs> it goes General in and then too. it goes out, you know. Um, but he's very present uh, in the moment, and that's all he wants is for it to live right <laughs> right there where it's happening in front of his eyes. If it does happen there, tears squirt from his eyes and he can't control his involvement. That um, contribution from behind a camera is so disarming because it's a um, form of, uh, you know, energy you get and um, Oh, <laughs> that's so cute. That, that I have one that goes. <laughs> I, I like that. Um, but yeah, I mean it's, and it was different on on everything. But the, but that mm, sort of knowing what the joke is and knowing where the. He comes in incredibly prepared. He knows, and it's very important to him. The thing he asks is, um, 
what are you doing here in this scene? And the scene is only about one thing, and you're only doing, asking, or trying to get one thing. And everything else is layer and dimension and filigree and fun. Mm. But it's all um, not allowed to diverge from what do you want, what, is, what are we trying to get here? And it's attached to story. He's a great storyteller. And in terms of the other directors that you've worked with, I know it's silly to start singling out who's the greatest, whatever, but is there a director or two who helped you mature in your craft as an actor more than others in the way that they worked with you, whether it was earlier on or more recently? Oh, I mean, I feel completely beholden to the directors that I've worked with, mostly because they've just <laughs> made me look good, you know, uh, and made me look like I knew what I was doing, and most of the time, I don't. So, um, I can't really say that one is greater than the other. Uh, you know, they've all been such different people. Um, I mean, certainly Alan Pakula has a special place in my heart because um, I can't, you know, thank him in pr person, but he knows how I feel. Um, Sidney Pollack was an amazing uh, teacher because he, he, t he knows everything about the camera. And I had never really paid attention to the camera. It was just this thing you're not allowed to look in. I knew that. Um, but. He, he uh, taught me m more about uh, the movement of the camera and where it was placed and why. And he was interested in that. And he kept trying to draw me into being interested in that. And I just don't care about that, really. I mean, <laughs> and I'm, everybody said, why don't you direct? You'd be so, I don't want to direct. I don't want to be responsible for this. This is so boring, you know, and all the equipment. <laughs> You wouldn't shoot with this, but you would have to pay attention to it. You know, the equipment of, of filmmaking, I'm not interested in. Mm -hmm. Well, you actually started out in theater. Mm -hmm. And in a way, perhaps, that was the primary relationship that you've had is to other actors, to the text, and to the director. Mm -hmm. And I know that you haven't been able to do that much theater over the past two decades or so. Um, in a previous interview that we did on stage, uh, Meryl Streep talked about having four children and how that keeps you, if you're a good mother, from doing theater. Um, well, I'm not saying that, you know, there are a lot of bad mothers who are actresses in the theater. I'm just saying that my children are so demanding and, <clears throat> and now bad if at night, you know, if I were gone, that wouldn't be good. So I like to know where they are at night, because <laughs> they're teenagers. I understand. Some of them. In terms, though, of your theater background, <clears throat> how, I mean, do you feel that what you did, whether it was at Yale Drama School or, indeed, your first work at Joseph Papp's Public Theater, was that a very important foundation for what you then did in film, or were they relatively different kinds of animals for you? I didn't <clears throat> make the distinction, and I probably should have. What I was saying to you about the first reading of a screenplay is the way I feel about the first reading of a play. I like it better than anything, um, because it's all happening in front of you, and fresh, and new. And <clears throat> I think, I've never been in a play more than 11 weeks. So I, I don't know what it's like to play something over a year. I think it's a different kind of meditation and exercise and um, <clears throat> challenge. I've not, I've not done it. Um, and I think probably that's why film pulled me, because it's, it's more immediate. It's quicker and uh, fresher, easier to make fresh. Um, uh, what was the question? Well, okay. Whether theater was a very yeah. important foundation to do the yes, film Yes, it is a, a great foundation, and uh, yeah. It certainly made me the kind of actress that I am, which is scattered, and um, <laughs> versatile, you know, that's what they... And um, 
I, I liked, I've always, because I trained as a repertory actress, nobody knows what that means anymore, but that means you play. You know, at any given time, you're carrying two or three characters within you, and whatever night it happens to be, you, you pull that one to the front and uh, live in that. Um, that's how I was trained, and I, I really like that. Uh, so I've always imagined that there were a lot of different people and possibilities living inside me and wanted to exercise that. Um, so my training in the theater helped, helped me have a varied career, I'm sure. Once your children are grown, is there a chance that you might indeed go back and do more theater? Is that something that you'd like I'm to do? I'm supposed to do uh, some theater. I said I would. I'm trying to get out of it now, of course. <laughs> Um, in uh, uh, the summer. <laughs> oh, that's close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can tell you there are at least 800 people that I know of who would be there. Right yeah, away I'm going to do The Seagull it. with Kevin Klein. Wow. <laughs> w would it be Shakespeare in the park or the, no? Well, they were looking around where to do it. We were going to do it in the park, but uh, too much uh, interference with those mics, you know? <laughs> And you get the uh, taxi drivers and the weather report and all sorts of other things transmit through those things. Uh, I think it's, it's harder to do a play where pauses are important and must be sacrosanct and empty. Mm. So I think we'll do it indoors, but Mike will direct it. Mike Nichols, mm -hmm. oh, this is exciting news. <laughs> Great. Um, nevertheless, I'm also thinking about how in tonight's film, the comedic side emerges. I mean, we tend to think of you, I think, primarily as a great dramatic actress because it's primarily for films like Sophie's Choice or um, Out of Africa that your accolades and greater visibility have come. But I, I think back to things like She Devil, where I know it's not a great film, but you seem to be having such a ball. <laughs> Has its moments, but <laughs> you seem to be having such a ball, <laughs> you know, playing this romance novelist who is vapid and duplicitous and totally, you know, self-immersed, um, and, and death becomes her, and, and defending your life, but there aren't that many other comic films in the Meryl Streep filmography, and I'm wondering, do you prefer to do drama, or is it just that people aren't thinking of you for the dr comic roles, or... <laughs> I think a lot of it has to do with how you're first uh, perceived on film because that image is so huge and my first film, well my, the first film that uh, where Hunter. people noticed who I was was The Deer Hunter and that was sort of, thank you, <laughs> and um, I, I, you know, that's sort of you make your impression with that, and then you fight against it the whole rest of your uh, career, in a way. Mm. Um, not that I fought it, but I think people saw me as a wan, blonde, sad girl, you know, who <laughs> had a limited life experience. And, you know, that's because that's who I was playing. And, but I came to that part from a training that where I, I had never been in a realistic play. I'd been in these weird, wild, uh, expressionistic c comedies, mostly, because that's what they were doing um, at the Yale Drama School when I was there. <clears throat> Very odd things. I'd never been in a Chekhov play. I have, until I'd d done The Cherry or Orchard uh, when I was a grown-up. But when I was a student, <clears throat> Yeah, I didn't have any experience. Hmm. So it was a surprise to come to a film career with this very realistic um, part. And um, then I did The Holocaust, which was not too far out of that um, mold. And then I tried to do some different, some different things. Hmm. But it was hard, yeah. 
I actually read somewhere too, I had never seen this in any of the official filmographies, but I found a little note that your TV debut was not Holocaust, but in something called Secret Service, which was a Civil War oh, melodrama yeah. from 1977. Well, that was actually the, the Phoenix Theater, which uh, I had worked in the, the Phoenix um, my first season in New York. And that was one of the plays. I, I was in, it was a, uh, yeah, melodrama from the Civil War era. It was awful. It was a, a vehicle for William Gillette, who was a famous actor in the 19th century. And um, John Lithgow played that part. Oh. It was a wonderful company. That was a repertory company. We did, um, that season, we did Arthur Miller's A Memory of Two Mondays and uh, Tennessee Williams' um, 27 Wagons Full of Cotton and Secret Service, all in the same season. Wow. And it was a, a great company of actors, really wonderful. Mary Beth Hurt was in it, and um, oh, who else? <laughs> Going back to Roy Poole and uh, Tony Musanti and uh, oh, Michael Tucker, I think. If, yeah, yeah okay. great group. I think I came across this detail in reading about the Museum of Television and Radio, which was acquiring all sorts of things that no one had ever heard of. Oh, and yeah. when I saw that one, I said, I never heard of that one, and yeah. I've been reading Meryl Streep filmographies for years. So, <laughs> Now, you mentioned that your initial image on screen in Deer Hunter was this wan, blonde thing, mm -hmm. but you've certainly come a very long way from that image, especially with a film like The River Wild. Mm -hmm. Because when I think of that film, um, the image that comes to mind is that of a really, I don't even want to say heroine, it's a feisty hero who happens to be female. Mm -hmm. Because in that film, you got to do and insisted upon doing the actual physical, active things that a hero normally does. And maybe it's precisely because Curtis Hansen, who directed it as the guest next week, and David Strathairn, who co-starred as your husband, is our guest in two weeks. <laughs> I did want to ask a little about the experience of making The River Wild, and what, I mean, was the challenge of the physicality where you had to do the rapids and all that, was that one of the things you really wanted to do precisely to overcome a lot of that earlier imagery? Uh, no. I wanted to do that because I had, at that point, three little girls, and I wanted them... Uh, they never saw me, you know, sort of get up and do anything. <laughs> um, and I was feeling physically cautious, you know, I was, I guess, 40-something. And, um, you know, that thing sets in, and I, I wanted to confront certain physical fears and do something exciting physically, just as an actor to, and this was a, a, a good script, um, great cast. <laughs> but I must say, after it was all over, I opened the New Yorker and there was a cartoon that said, there's two sort of soigne people at a bar, and the woman says, do you want to see Meryl Streep go down the river on a raft? <laughs> I so sort of thought it reduced a very exciting movie to um, <laughs> to what it was, but um, <laughs> I really I I loved it. It was uh, exciting, and my kids, my girls really liked it. I made it for the kids. There's certain ones that I do that way. Mm -hmm. And also, I remember Kevin Bacon, who was a guest here in this series, yeah. mentioning that he was very moved by a detail of your own character that came through because you fought initially against the idea of having your character kill someone. Mm -hmm. In other words, you didn't like the fact that ultimately you would have to do that violent act and try to change it. And I found that very interesting because it's an example, I guess, of when an actor tries to have some aspect of what you care about personally enter the role, but then finally you realized you couldn't do that. Um, yeah, well, there's some times where... <laughs> <clears throat> you need a gun. Um, it just comes down to that. I've, uh, I wanted her to outwit him. I wanted him to, you know, sort of be knocked down by his own hubris and stupidity. And uh, But sometimes you just can't wrestle your agenda into an entertainment. And uh, I think Curtis had the right idea, mm -hmm. I mean, in the end. But it's still... I have to say it was the was a nauseating 
feeling. <laughs> it really was awful. That's uh, one of the things I remember most. Mm. Although I guess one could rationalize it a little bit and say that you, your character was protecting your child at that point. Oh, I can rationalize that... everything. Don't worry about that. <laughs> but I, I wouldn't, no, my big, my big thing was I wouldn't pose with the gun on the poster, oh. you know, with the <laughs> shirt open and the, you know, that kind of thing they always do. Because that's, that's the glamorizing of the weaponry I don't get. I, I get when you're protecting your child and you're in a drama and that's the thing and you got to use it for that but there's no you know I'm not sort of uh, licking the barrel and stuff <laughs> which I find really sick and offensive and uh, that's you know understood now I have a lot more questions but I have a feeling that this audience does too so I'm going to ask that we raise the lights a little bit so that we can acknowledge some of the hands and open it up beyond my own voice. I see a gentleman right here in the fourth row and then a few around oh, here. Oh there you are! <laughs> it's, it's so hard to see. When yeah I, have I the lights sort of on. prefer this. So we'll go here and then I saw a few others. Why do you think the film before and after that you did with Liam Neeson didn't do quite as well as some of your other films? Um, well, I have, a the I have a theory about that. Um, and part of it has to do with the way that it was shot. I think that that movie in, I mean, I'm speaking very frankly. I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> but I felt like it, there was some life sucked out of it. I mean, it, it just... It didn't breathe. And part of the way that it was shot, this is a technical thing. Um, in the old days, that you had to be quiet when the other person was speaking uh, because they couldn't uh, match the track. Here's the technical part of my understanding of <laughs> filmmaking. But in recent years, you know, you can overlap each other and people don't care about that so much. There are some people, directors, who maintain um, uh, a desire to keep the tracks clean. And so if I was playing with uh, Liam and he would be speaking with me, even if I overrode him in the scene, so that his, his voice could be heard. Do you know what I mean? It was weird. It was <laughs> like um, robots acting. Or, you know, it, it, it just introduced an artificiality that um, was very odd. And I didn't understand the need for it because they do have the technology now where you can speak at the same time, overlap each other, and have a usable uh, cut. Just but that's part of the, that's what I think made it sort of feel like it was in a test tube a little bit. Mm. It just reminds me, though, that if the central identity of your character in today's film is that of a daughter, in the 90s, it's very much the central identity of the mother because I think of the River Wild, before and after, one true thing, mm. where really so much more is made of the importance of domestic ties between a mother mm -hmm. and a child than other films that I've come across. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you've obviously, I think, chosen projects that relate to your own central identity and, and done I'm sure, but you know, you get to a certain age and they don't want you to play anything but mothers and, <laughs> and I'm happy be, to do that because I think it's a, you know, very fraught and interesting relationship, but uh, yeah, and a lot of people don't want to be mothers too soon because, you know, <laughs> it limits them or something. It's true. Okay, down here and then here and a few more in the back. What um, led you to go into acting? Was it a, a performance that you had seen, an influence, uh, something you felt you had to do? Um, I think it was probably the four o'clock movie because 
often my mother wasn't home and I was supposed to be doing my homework and f at four o'clock you could watch all these old movies they had on and um, I remember seeing Carol Lombard and you know uh, Lucille Ball I loved and all the old great actresses uh, on those old movies not one performance really I don't think I came, I decided to go into acting late and sort of in a less than um, committed way and was so uh, eager to be talked out of it <clears throat> all along the way, all through drama school. I took the law boards my last year. <clears throat> I mean, I signed up, slept through the test <laughs> because I had a performance the night before. Um, I've always felt a little uneasy about, you know, the worth of it as a profession, you know. You can't change the world with that. And also, I, I didn't even imagine that I would have any, any sort of impact or success or be any good at it. I just liked it. And I just liked it, you know. And I was good at it. And my friend said, you know, you're really good. So that's what I ended up doing. <laughs> yep. Question on the aisle there. I read that when you started out, you said that doing a performance was like a dream for you, sort of like being in love. I very freeing. Oh, very freeing. I'm sorry, freeing, I couldn't hear. Yes, very yes, freeing, like being in love. Is it still that way for you? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, an exhilaration and uh, feeling vividly alive in that way. Um, it's a great feeling because it's fiction. And, um, <laughs> yeah. There were two hands down here. Oh, yes, here and then in the middle, and then I'll go further back. The gentleman in the middle and then on the right. Okay. 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 Ah, where did I start here? Okay. Wow. <laughs> I was a little girl, and I wanted to know, um, is there anything that runs through your mind or um, helps you focus between the acting when you're on stage or something? When you're on stage or doing the film, is there anything that you focus on that helps you concentrate, that keeps you in character when you're doing one of these works? Yes, there is. <laughs> Pack your own bag. <laughs> and I don't think, but I just won't tell you it. I've, I told only one person, Kevin Klein, this. And I know he won't tell you because he's forgotten it. <laughs> um, and I told him because I thought it would help. Um, it's just a thing that I, I don't think it's valuable to impart or share because then whenever I'm in something you'll think, oh, she's thinking that. But um, I, I always think, uh, I have a little mantra, a thing. Yes, it's a central thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Although, if, if I may be so bold as to cite um, an interview I once read, where you talked about ironweed, I thought this detail was extraordinary because ironweed, I thought it was a fascinating dark film in which you play a street person with Jack Nicholson, Albany, 38, and your character is always a little bit hunched wearing this hat with the red-rimmed eyes and you sing a wonderful Irish song. You said that you kept in mind the image of a question mark for your posture and that that's what helped you stay in character or, or helped you feel the character. I just found that detail very remarkable in, in its concreteness, and I'm sure that that isn't something you would use in another character, but it was appropriate to that one. So I hope I'm not telling a tale out of school. But. Thanks, Annette. Yeah. <laughs> it was only for that character. <laughs> yeah. It's not always a question mark. Um, it's just, no, it's not. That, that was an image that was an image, very specific image, and I didn't realize that it was a question mark. I always thought it was a, what's the clef that's below a treble clef? Yeah. Face I know, clef? I studied violin. I know. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, yeah, that was sort of... That inversion. It was, yeah, 
that's sort of a defeat, you know, that people carry. You, okay. I mean, I don't always have an image like that, but that was, it, yeah. It worked for that one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. There was uh, one here and then the gentleman in the middle and then the gentleman on the right. Yes. Sorry. I just lost. There you are. question is, in some of the scenes that this woman has um, watched, it seems impossible that you could have done more than one take because of the intensity of the scene, the overwhelming power of it. For example, the scene in Out of Africa at the grave, was that just one take? And if not, how much recovery time between takes? <clears throat> we did it about 10 times. <laughs> I know. I thought three would have been enough, um, but no. Um, you know, I have a dear friend, John Cazale, was in The Godfather and told a tale about the scene where Marlon has been shot, The Godfather's been shot, and he's in a hotel room, and I'm not sure if this is John or if this is a story he tells about Al, but <clears throat> one of them was standing by the bedside and came into the room and saw Marlon in this state and just was, you know, just overcome. Couldn't help it. You know, you get ready as an actor, you're in your trailer, you think, when are they going to shoot this? Ugh, I'm just <sighs> bursting. And finally, lunch is over, and they say, <laughs> Okay, we're ready for you, and um, you go upstairs, and he was just overcome, and he brought, and it was the rehearsal, and uh, Marlon opened one eye, and he said, save it for the close-up, kid. <laughs> and um, so it's very hard to wrangle these emotions. I mean, some, some you come with, and it's almost like God came with you to the set. You, you don't know if he's going to show up. And sometimes he doesn't. You know, and it's really such a crapshoot. Sometimes I was thinking on the way over here of something profound that I could say. Can I say it now? Sure. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I thought... What is it? I mean, the, uh, really, the longer I do this, the less I understand about this entire process. And I think it's 50% fairy dust and 50% farm work. Mm -hmm. You know, it takes stamina and mus musculature, and it's boring, and then there's magic in it, too. And... Uh, to answer your question about that scene, yes, we did, we did it about 10 times. We did it from across the, you know, veldt and then a little bit closer and then very close and then mid-shot, which is what they actually used. And I had used everything up on the close-up. No, they didn't. So you can't ever know what, what's going to happen. You just have to say, can I have another one if you don't feel good? And insist. The gentleman in the back there, yes. Uh, are there any actresses in the next generation, for lack of a better term, that you look at, what would you say about, like, for instance, perspective, or perspective, like, Oh, oh, everybody. Actresses I mean, of the new generation that you feel are... Yes, uh, young actresses who are, and I won't name three, because, really, there is so much talent out there. Um, and unafraid to do anything. I mean, it's good. It's real good. 
because for a while there, just before I came up, it, and that's why I was intimidated to even imagine that I could be in the movies, because the task was to be beautiful, period, for women. I mean, there were exceptions, you know, Anna Magnani maybe, but um, <laughs> Kim Stanley. Uh, there were exceptions. And people would break through, leave. Leave was a, I remember when I was in, an undergraduate in college. She'll be thrilled to hear that. And I went to see her in, in uh, Cries and Whispers. And uh, then watched everything that, that she did. Because she was just unafraid. And it didn't matter what it looked like. And there was no consciousness of it. Um, so free and inspiring. But yeah, in the younger generation, there are there are a lot of people who are who are way out there, willing to go, you know. I just remember you and Hillary Swank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, how about her? Wow, Hillary Swank yeah. being invoked. Yeah, she's amazing. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I really admire uh, admire her, and but again, she's not alone. There's a lot of amazing talent. There's a young man back there that I just saw earlier. Yes. Oh. Sorry, you, you, I was calling on someone else, so I can't see your lips, so I didn't get the question exactly. To what extent do you trust your director? Do you allow yourself to trust your director? Oh, I, I trust the director with everything. Although, I must say with Barbet, Schroeder, in... Before and after. Yeah, I, I didn't... Thank you. <laughs> I knew that. I try to be useful. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> trust that process. I thought it was cracked, and I, I didn't understand it. And, when, you know, and I, I felt it was like blood-sucking. Uh, it was taking something important away from the life of the film. Um, so probably I didn't give myself to, into his hands in the way that I have with other, other directors. Um, but that's the way I like to work. I don't want to be boss, you know? I want to know that he has that architecture firm and the structure is going to hold and I can hurl my entire body into it and it won't break. And that's a, a, a confidence I need to go out there. If I feel weird, um, you know, actors can't, can't give it to people they don't trust each other or the director, so. Yeah, the gentleman in the middle there. Have you, have you ever thought of wedding history? Because, you know, I mean, and, and wedding history, music, wedding, performing, have, you, have you ever thought of writing for the screen? Has that been an option? Do you think that writing for the screen would be as exciting as performing, or could be as exciting? I, I probably, I don't think that's my area of expertise. I think, um, <clears throat> You have to have a, a sense of structure, um, and I'm not a linear <laughs> thinker, you may have noticed. Um, so, no, I've never imagined, but I have written a great deal of my own oeuvre. I mean, I have, if they let me. Um, in Kramer versus Kramer, uh, Robert Benton didn't have a testimony for the mother who was t trying to retain custody of her or get custody of her son. And Bob let me write that. So it's fun to, to write things out of the voice that I know, but I, I don't really have that great an overview of the whole thing. Okay, uh, down here, first row and then second row? Yeah. And then I'll come back here. Yeah. <laughs> 
There's so many Australians here. <laughs> <laughs> About the bridges of Madison County, what was it like to work with an actor-director, Clint Eastwood? Yeah, that's a question. It was very much a woman's story. Um, and, but with the actor-director, it was very much a uh, it was very much a woman's story, but how was it achieved, the strength of the female in that relationship with the actor-director? Well, um, the question is about Bridges, uh, and that script was really good. I mean, it came in, uh, Richard Legravenese wrote that script, and he's a writer who loves women. I mean, the book was not in love, well, I guess at a distance was uh, admiring of that character, of the woman's character, but the book was in love with the man, and it was more his story. Richard flipped that, and um, Clint worked with him specifically to do that. And I think that has something to do with what he knows about his own strength as, a, as an actor and as a presence on screen. It's not what he gives, it's what he withholds. Um, and so that dynamic was important. And really, they, I mean, he, they delivered that movie to me. Do you know what I mean? I, I just had to walk in and be Francesca because it was a great part and it was written as you see it. It was um, not anything, I mean I didn't write any single shred of that. Um, and as for the relationship with a director who's also the actor, that could be tricky and I, I think he's sort of masterful in his ability to not make you feel like you're uh, being observed. And there was one moment only when I was acting with him and I saw him watching me, you know, in an icky way, like <laughs> checking it out. And oh, it was awful. It was a, an awful feeling, like a betrayal. And I called him on it right away. I said, you're directing me when you're, <laughs> you're supposed to be listening to me and you're directing me. And um, he said, you're right, I was. I don't like the way you did <laughs> And it was the only time that he had really said that. I mean, he gave me a lot of freedom. That's the kind of director I like. <laughs> And a footnote, Richard Lagravenese is not only the writer of things like The Fisher King, but the writer-director of Living Out Loud, which we may be showing with Danny DeVito in a few weeks. Yes, please. question about Marvin's Room, which was originally the play, and then the film. Did you have a choice in terms of which sister you were going to play? And if so, why did you choose to be that sister, leave the sort of prickly one that, that you went, yeah? And, <laughs> and what was it like to work with Diane Keaton? Yes, in Marvin's Room I did get a choice because it came to me first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, which part to play, and uh, actually it was in another incarnation, uh, Angelica Houston was going to play Lee, and I was going to play Diane's character. But that one, that was a different director, and it went away. <clears throat> and then came back in its uh, new revised uh, uh, version. And um, Jane Rosenthal and Bob De Niro were still producing it with <clears throat> Scott Rudin. Um, and I wanted to play Lee because I had played so many good mothers that I felt like a fraud. I mean, <laughs> I just wanted to play one just sort of like I am. <laughs> you know, that scene with the potato chips, really, from my life. Um, but 
I'm kidding. I, I, I just, I, I wanted to be the bad girl because I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a good daughter, and I had been a lot, played a lot of good mothers who do the right thing. And it was more interesting to look at a mother who, is, who really does the wrong thing with her kids, and uh, Lee, Lee is that. Question here and then one down here. And I love Diane. I love <laughs> Diane working. I was wondering when you became aware that you had so much talent. When did you become aware that you had so much talent when it comes to accents? Um, uh, in the sixth grade. <laughs> uh, it's a cruel art, you know, when you can do your teacher. <laughs> and um, get laughs and yeah, but I'm not really that good at it. I have to work at it. Nah, I'm not. Tracy Ullman is amazing. I mean, and she's a friend of mine, but I don't really like her to come over because <laughs> she, she's just better at it and my kids really love it. <laughs> and then I try to keep up and, you know, sort of talk Cockney, but I, I really can't do it. I have to. I'm a little more <clears throat> dogged, I guess, and have to practice. <laughs> yes, here. Um, I'm an actor, and I'm finding that over the years, um, as my standards for my, as I get older, my standards get higher, and as that happens, I become increasingly terrified with each new project. And I'm wondering if you experience the same thing, and if so, how do you grapple with that? As an actor, I find that my standards get higher the older I get, and it terrifies me. And how do you, or do you grapple with that sense as each project comes forth? <clears throat> I just saw Linda Lavin in The Tale of the a Allergist's Wife. <clears throat> so great. She was so wonderful. And I was reading the playbill, and she mentions Mike. Nichols giving her some advice and he says to her oh this is really the Mike Nichols night isn't it I should get him a tape um, <laughs> I will <laughs> but he said to her you know she said she was so scared to do this part that she was doing with him I can't remember what what they were working on but he said terror is your best friend you know whatever destabilizes you will uh, get to the core and, you know, you'll have that seismic activity you want. Um, and if you're happy and complacent and sure of yourself, you won't be able to do that. It's, and it's, uh, you know, constantly a process of unsettling yourself <clears throat> and going to basically where you don't want to go. That's why I've uh, made Music of the Heart uh, two years ago, and um, I like not working, you know, because I don't upset myself, and yet I'm, I'm, I have to go back and do it again because it's, it's, I need it for, my, you know, your soul. But terror is good. Terror is uh, your friend. <laughs> We're almost out of time. There's one question here. I'll try to get one or two more in fast, yes? You've played so many real people, for example, in the Australian film A Cry in the Dark, playing a woman accused of a crime, and it wasn't really clear completely in the film whether she might have been guilty. Um, have you ever gotten feedback from any of the real people you have portrayed, and could you talk a little bit about A Cry in the Dark? <clears throat> yeah, that's um, one of my favorite movies, that in all of my work, um, I'm almost more proud of that than almost anything. I, I really, and it's not my work, I, it's Fred Skepsey, who I think is an amazing filmmaker. Um, you know, if they gave the 
award for degree of difficulty, he would win it hands down. He, he really takes very tough uh, material. This was exacerbated, the, the difficulty it was exacerbated by the fact that he, you know, um, when we made the film, Lindy Chamberlain was uh, suing the Australian government to, for basically robbing her of her life uh, for a number of years. They put her in jail for four years and she had a baby <clears throat> when she went in and basically didn't see that child for four years and she did not commit that crime and eventually they did exonerate her completely. Um, but I thought the film was so ahead of its time in the way that it talked about the way that television news uh, is manipulated. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, and it was early days for that perception to come to American audiences. I don't think they understood it, but uh, it, I thought it was a really brilliant movie. Um, and yes, it's, it's a big responsibility to play somebody who actually lived. Um, and I felt that responsibility to Karen Silkwood and uh, Isaac Dinesen but you feel it much more when the person's standing on the set. <laughs> and um, that was true with Lindy, and she was very gracious about having me sort of tread all over her life. But, um, but it was a sad thing. I mean, her, she lost her marriage and everything, eventually. Hmm. Okay, uh, gentleman on the aisle there. <laughs> I'll just summarize. I see in all your films this attention to detail. In an interview with Gene Siskel, he mentioned a, a detail about brushing your skirt in Bridges of Madison County, and you corrected him. Um, how much of that kind of attention to detail, like the brushing of the skirt, is conscious or deliberate, and how much is just spontaneous? <clears throat> well... <laughs> I'm always accused of being a very technical actress, and usually I claim credit for s stuff like that after the fact, <laughs> when it's been pointed out that it was so wonderful. And then I say, oh yes, I know. I, <laughs> I designed that, you know. No, you don't. It's, if you're in, you know, if, if you're in your character and in the life, you kind of can't make a wrong move. That was something I realized when I was uh, doing Sophie's Choice and I came home and I said to my husband, I can't do anything wrong. Everything I do is right. And it was, I mean, I wasn't, you know, bragging, but it was like, it was true. Because I so lived in this body that, um, I just, it wasn't designed. No, each gesture isn't designed. You don't design stuff, although people do. I mean, certain, in comedy, you know, on stage, you have a bit, you work it out. You, if somebody screws it up, you're really mad at the props people. And that's of great value. You know, Danny Kaye coming in three hours before they shoot and working out some business. Because when it's done effortlessly, it's just pure joy. But there's, I mean, I, I think in, in film, you can't let any of the work show. The work precedes it. It's way, way behind. And it's like your lunch. It's in your stomach, but you don't want to look at it. <laughs> Well, 
I know that there are more questions. I also know we could probably be here for another two hours because there is a lot to talk about in celebrating Meryl Streep, but I have promised that she could get back to her children on time tonight, so I'll, I'll just conclude by saying that if, as you once said, acting is an act of compassionate understanding, then I just think all of us believe that you have achieved a greatness that is anchored in your own lucidity and compassion, in your own ability to inhabit these characters in such a way that they become you and you become them, and we are all the better for it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Annette. Thank you, Thank you very much.